dear friends and future friends, I actually have to begin with an apology and an explanation because I'm giving the keynote address and then I have to quietly leave and go back to a conference I've just come from and then come back to this conference. And it's even more awkward because as you'll hear as I'm uh, delivering my keynote address, I'm challenging us to these poems of action that Manus um, talked about. But it is an honor to address so many people who have been key in ensuring the human security of women around the world. I'm well aware that many of you have had first-hand experience at grassroots dealing with threats to women's human security. And if anything, we've seen that these threats are getting worse, that these dangers are continually present and increasing in the lives of women worldwide was something I recognized and indeed saw firsthand in so many parts of the world as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. And that's why I think it was so important, for example, that Secretary General Kofi Annan decided to appoint a woman, to appoint Hina Jelani as his special representative on human rights defenders. Because on the front line of human security, we need a woman who understands the risks faced by women every day. There's one positive change since Beijing. Although women worldwide st wide still suffer from violence, discrimination, and lack of power, now at least women know this. That knowledge is the beginning of power. During this conference, as we explore the meaning of human security for women, we must keep that practical experience and the knowledge factor to the forefront of our minds. We must make use of our knowledge of the many obstacles women face and the many but sometimes insufficient solutions that women create. The theme of this conference, Clash or Consensus, Gender and Human Security in a Globalized World, challenges us to raise difficult questions and find real answers. We must ask ourselves, how can we apply our knowledge and experience to actions that make the world safer for women? How can we translate the varied viewpoints and backgrounds represented at this conference into a coherent and effective plan of action? We must find a way. The threats to women in every nation are too great for us to fail. My message today is simple and straightforward. This conference must make a difference. It's time to act. As we meet here, we're aware of the daily experiences of women in danger around the world. In the New York Times of September the 16th, we read of an unintended consequence of liberation, threatening the lives and security of Iraqi women. Rape and kidnapping have increased, while honor killings continue to occur. In such murders, a male relative kills a woman who has been raped, a murder incurring a maximum sentence of only three years. Women are increasingly veiling themselves and remaining indoors, while college students, doctors and lawyers who moved freely around Baghdad during Saddam Hussein's rule now stay inside for fear of violence. Meanwhile, the Iraqi Ministry of the Interior appears to think women are not part of its remit. Personal security and freedom from violence are basic human rights, without which women cannot hope to participate in building democracy, peace or sustainable development. When we talk about security, we must begin with safety in one's own home, the difficult topic of safety from violence at the hands of those who often claim to care about their women. Then we must talk about the security to walk out one's front door, to attend classes, to work, to participate fully in the life of a citizen. Conflict and post-conflict situations throw into particularly stark relief the absence of these basic securities. And we'll pay special attention over the coming days, I hope, to the situation of women in Iraq, Afghanistan, Palestine, Lib Liberia, and other zones of conflict. In exploring the experiences of women in these apparently extreme situations, we should ask ourselves both what is truly unique and what, sadly, is all too common in women's experiences within and outside conflict zones. Let's not forget what's happening to women in Afghanistan. 
Amnesty International reports that while more girls are in school and more women are at work, the risk of rape is very high and girls as young as eight are being forced into marriage. Alas, the plight of women in general has not improved much since the fall of the Taliban and women are not well protected by the criminal justice system. Janet Jalil at the BBC noted that forced virginity tests, kidnap and torture still take place. A human rights report Uh, Human Rights Watch report states that many Afghan women are frightened to leave their homes. Two years after claims that the war would liberate them, some Afghan women are still being sold by their husbands for an average of $3,000. As these abuses continue, we must be responsible for continuously calling attention to women's rights, even when global media and funding attention has moved elsewhere. We must always also remember that the beginning of safety is the safety to speak out. At the global level, we hear too little from the women of Afghanistan, of Iraq, of Palestine, of Liberia, and of other areas of conflict. Too few stories are told in their voices, and too little about the solutions they imagine and create. It's up to all of us, but particularly those of us in the global north, to make space and listen more closely to the voices not often heard. Let those among us from European and United States backgrounds be honest and admit we don't listen enough. Differences belong to the field of culture. The problem arises when one culture, any culture, is considered the model for an ethical subject. This is a great problem, a kind of blindness for many many of us from Europe or North America. Women from different cultures at a conference such as this must be prepared to create that vital space. We must come together to see how to think of the sameness of the ethical subject without slipping in one culture, one history as the model. I sense, for example, that women in Muslim societies don't want to face the stark choice of an increasingly fundamentalist society or a Western McDonald's culture. Rightly, they seek the space to make their own choices based on their spirituality and on the universality of human rights. Women's rights grow out of the struggle of women to determine their choices, their priorities, and their vision. And after what Manus said, I'm glad that I chose the words of an Irish poet, a great friend of mine, to capture this. The poet's name is Ivan Boland. She's actually a professor of poetry in Stanford University. And she put it very well when she wrote of women finding a voice where they had found a vision. I think that's a wonderful way of capturing what Manus was saying that we must do. Attempting to answer these questions shows us the importance of a broad concept of human security. This involves a move away, as Manus has said, from concern with state security to a concern with human security, protecting individuals and communities rather than simply state boundaries. The UN Development Program notes that human security encompasses safety from chronic threats of hunger, disease, and repression. These are needs that may require a global response to widespread and global threats, as well as strong domestic responses, needs that may not best be met, as we know, militarily. The report, Human Security Now, produced by the Independent Commission on Human Security, co-chaired by Amartya Sen and Sadako Gatta, the former High Commissioner for for, um, uh, Refugees, that report states that the concept involves protecting people from critical and pervasive threats and situations, building on their strengths and aspirations. It also means creating systems that give people the building blocks of survival, dignity, and livelihood, end quote. Human, Human security connects different types of freedoms, freedom from want, freedom from fear, and freedom to take action on one's own behalf. We may reflect, how well do our societies guarantee these securities to women? What actions must we take to ensure that all women have the freedom to take action on their own behalf? For there to be action, there must be resources. I know how necessary it is to have resources for small grassroots activities that reach those women most in need, such as rural women, women who are experiencing violence, women in the informal sector, women living in poverty. And 
I'm delighted that Kavita Ramdas is not only supporting this conference, but is here uh, participating actively as the head of the Global Fund for Women and that she's expanding the Global Fund in ways that I think we must all be supportive of because it does such crucial work in identifying and supporting women around the world at every level. Indeed, the desperate need for resources for grassroots human rights work internationally persuaded me to be persuaded by Mary Ann Stein, who's sitting here, to take on the chair of the Fund for Global Human Rights. And I will keep women's rights to the forefront of the activities to be supported by that fund also. Each of us needs to think of how we can address women's needs for security in everything we do and how we can raise the financial support to make those plans happen. One of the looming threats to human security in Muslim societies as it has already threatened other societies, is HIV and AIDS. Muslim-majority nations are in a position to tackle this critical threat before it reaches unmanageable levels. We've seen the devastating effects of this disease on the people of nations across the globe, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. We're beginning to see increasing infection rates across Asia, and its effects are felt in every country. Despite low overall levels of HIV-AIDS infection, North Africa and the Middle East is the only region outside of sub-Saharan Africa where a majority of those living with HIV are women. That's a big warning. Human security and HIV-AIDS are trapped in a vicious cycle. HIV and AIDS is fueled by human insecurity, social disruption, poverty and inequity. And in turn, HIV and AIDS creates further social disruption and exacerbates poverty. Heterosexual transmission now accounts for the majority of infections worldwide. Where there is gender inequity, women are less able to protect themselves from HIV or from the sexual violence they may be, that may expose them to HIV. Economic dependency worsens women's vulnerability to infection by partners who they are not in a financial position to leave partners who may or may not be faithful to them. Women usually have less access to health care and treatment for themselves, but bear the burden of caring for the community. Social constraints may prevent women from speaking out while simultaneously condoning male sexual norms that place women at risk. These are all crucial factors that foster the spread of HIV and AIDS, allowing it to reach epidemic proportions while denial and discrimination prevent it being acknowledged. If any of these social and cultural elements sound, sounds familiar, we must ask, how will we act now to protect women from HIV and AIDS? Taking action on HIV and AIDS and women is a key priority in my current work as head of the Ethical Globalization Initiative. At a recent conference, which we co-organized with a number of other groups, including two based here in Washington, on this issue, which was held in Botswana, we identified obstacles such as lack of women's leadership, discrimination and stigma against those living with HIV, lack of research capacity, and unfair international trade laws. It became clear that across countries, gender inequity worsens the impact of HIV and AIDS and makes it harder to reach women with treatment and prevention. The Ethical Globalization Initiative has formed strong partnerships with other groups to take action on these problems. For example, we'll be organizing a women's leadership conference, coordinating research on women and HIV and AIDS, and producing policy briefs to inform national and international policymakers about women's vulnerability within the pandemic. Now, as I address an audience of individuals that can truly make a difference to this disease, I hope that many of us take the opportunity provided by this conference to form partnerships and to combine our efforts and share experience. There is a great value and synergy to be gained by these partnerships. We must also ask ourselves whether stigma and discrimination are playing a role in masking the true extent of infection. In every country with high prevalence levels, including those with over 30%, the initial attitude to the disease was, that can't happen here. Every country has denied or played down or simply failed to look for the evidence that HIV is spreading among its general population. Every country has made statements that imply their society is somehow immune to this immune system disease, that their people, and particularly their women, are too moral to be affected. But unfortunately, 
there are circumstances where morality and faith are no protection against this infection. The almost incomprehensible levels of infection in countries such as Botswana, with 38.8% HIV prevalence, and South Africa, where 5 million people are living with HIV, didn't happen overnight. Public reluctance to acknowledge the problem, failure to tackle it immediately and head on, and failure of leadership and political advocacy allowed the disease to spread to its current disastrous levels. Conversely, relative successes in controlling and treating the epidemic by countries such as Thailand, Brazil, and Uganda have in common public leadership and openness about HIV and AIDS from early on in its spread. We must view apparently low prevalence levels in a country as an unparalleled opportunity to avoid calamity, an incentive to act now. At this unique historical junction in the progress of the disease in the Muslim world, Muslim leadership has the chance to create a different path and save millions of lives. And I invite us to use this conference as a springboard for action in meeting this human security challenge. A recent assessment of the next wave of HIV AIDS in China, Ethiopia, India, Nigeria, and Russia indicates that HIV and AIDS will go from between 14 to 23 million to between 50 and 75 million in these regions by 2010, in seven years' time. Even looking at lowest possible estimates, infections in Nigeria will rise from approximately 4 million to 10 million, Ethiopia from 2 to 7 million, and India from 7 to nearly 20 million. These are all countries with large Muslim populations, and I'm happy to see, looking at the list, that Ethiopia and India are strongly represented at this conference. With so many countries present here, you as leaders form an invaluable resource of the country-specific and culturally sensitive knowledge so needed to tackle HIV and AIDS from a gender perspective. The various ways in which women's health is compromised within specific societies are familiar to you. Some of the factors that impede women's access to health care, including the availability of clinics, the cost of services, control of our household resources, decision-making power in the family, social isolation, and time constraints. Women are often discriminated against in access to education, food, employment, financial resources, and primary health care. These are all areas where concrete actions can be taken. We must recognize that HIV and AIDS is a woman's issue now. The Global Coalition on Women and AIDS, um, facilitated by UNAIDS, is an informal association of organizations committed to mitigating the gendered effects of HIV and AIDS. And I'm happy to serve as a member of its steering committee, which has identified five key areas for action that can guide us during this conference. The coalition first aims to prevent HIV infection among women and girls. A second goal is to eliminate violence against women and girls, as violence poses a fundamental threat to women's achievement of human security. It highlights the importance of economic independence through its aim of protecting female property and inheritance rights. It acknowledges the female burden of care and aims to support women and girls in their caring responsibilities. Finally, it aims to ensure equal access to care, support, and treatment, emphasizing that an effective HIV and AIDS strategy must promote both prevention and treatment. This coalition of many organizations gives us a comprehensive, multifaceted model for tackling HIV and AIDS and other human security threats and issues that affect women. During this conference, we may consider how to form similar alliances of groups and identify issues that will improve women's lives. I would hope that we can find ways to use this conference as a launching pad for action on women's human security. For example, attendees at this conference might consider whether they could work together to establish a follow-up task force that would create a plan of action on human security. This task force could provide policy and program recommendations suited to protecting and empowering women, particularly in Muslim societies. A successful strategy requires tools. Let's remember that there's an important United Nations framework, the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, ratified by 173 countries, and its optional protocol now ratified by 54 countries. And I've no doubt that Nolene Hazer um, of UNIFEM, head of UNIFEM, will talk to you about this framework. And also, this UN framework is reinforced regionally by a number of legal instruments. Most recently, 
the optional protocol to the African Charter on human and people's rights, on the rights of women in Africa, providing a valuable framework for civil society and women's groups in particular to hold governments accountable. We must think about how each of us within our own fields of influence can act to protect women's human security. For example, and this is why I have to leave you, this evening I will be taking on the position of Chair of the Council of Women World Leaders. I'm frankly not interested in titles, but rather in using this position as effectively as I can to encourage women to change their position and have more choices. We need to think about immediate and sustainable action that each of us can take in whatever forum we have access to that will ensure human security for all. Another thing I'd like to ask for your help on. Later this month, I'll be giving one of two keynote addresses at the Arab Women's Summit in Amman, Jordan. The other keynote speaker will be my friend Merva Talawi, who was supposed to come here to this conference, but unfortunately is not able to. She's the executive director of the UN Economic Commission in Beirut. I think it would be very helpful to both of us to get your thoughts about what issues should be focused on. Queen Rania's presidency is a timely opportunity to push women's issues to the forefront of concern for Muslim-majority nations. I feel a great deal can be achieved during Queen Rania's presidency of the summit, and we should ask ourselves, what would we like to help to see accomplished by the end of her 18-month presidency? A band of time of 18 months under a good woman leader. What would we like to see accomplished? How can we all help? Because that's what this conference is all about. A key area we'll be addressing during this conference is the connection between human rights and human security. The Independent Commission on Human Security noted that protecting human rights are at the core of protecting human security. In order to protect people in situations of violent conflict, the Commission recommends that human security should be placed formally on the agenda of security organizations. The impunity of perpetrators of human rights abuses must be ended. That impunity is flagrant, it's worldwide, and women mustn't take it any longer. This will require community strategies and humanitarian assistance. The report also notes that special attention should be given to protecting women and other vulnerable groups. These are suggestions we may bear in mind over the next two days while we examine the many other connections between human rights and human security. In her paper, From Basic Needs to Basic Rights, Manus, President of our Generous Hosts, Women's Learning Partnership for Rights Development and Peace, suggests that women's search for identity is a universal phenomenon, culturally adapted but with certain common values. Manus emphasizes the need to establish the moral priority of universal rights and to communicate these rights in ways that uphold and appreciate the diversity of lifestyles and culture. Strong involvement of women from the global south is essential to this process. At the same time, respect for multiculturalism and diverse cultures shouldn't be misinterpreted as, and I quote Manus, nebulous and contradictory concept of cultural relativism that functionally justifies abuse of women based on cultural norms, end quote. She notes that women's rights are particularly strained in North Africa and the Middle East, while female, gen female genital cutting affects nearly 90 million women worldwide. These are issues directly threatening women's human rights and areas where civil and political leadership can affect change. In addressing women's human rights, we must realize that across societies, sexual violence is one of the ultimate taboos. No society is open about it, and none like to admit that it occurs. Yet we know that it does, within and outside of marriage, often between powerful men and economically, socially and culturally less powerful women. If we're concerned about gender and human security, we must pay attention to the most basic security of all, personal integrity. Freedom from violence is a freedom denied to millions of women. Physical and sexual violence are frequently indivisible, as physical force enables coerced sex and sexual control may be enforced through beatings and threats. The epidemic of violence is intimately connected, as I've said, with the HIV and AIDS epidemic, as heterosexual transmission is the dominant mode of transmission worldwide. Women in violent relationships cannot protect themselves or others. Rape in conflict situations is one part of the challenge. Rape within relationships and embodied in social norms of sexual acceptability is another. To challenge HIV and ensure women's human security, we must take the difficult path of being open about and challenging 
gender-based violence in the many forms it takes in our diverse societies. Manus notes that educated women possess the power and voice to achieve political change. Once women begin to achieve freedoms and have knowledge, this information cannot be unlearned and it becomes difficult to dislodge historical realities. Before the revolution in Iran, for example, women had achieved government and ambassadorial posts, were present in institutions of higher learning, and women's organizations were spreading around the country. The Islamic Republic's efforts to undo these achievements found resistance because people's minds, women's minds, had been changed. Manus suggests that Muslim women can educate the political elite through empowering interpretations of the Quran and the Ibadit, providing a basis for legislation and implementation of change. A women's rights literacy program can use international agreements to motivate grassroots campaigns. She points out that Muslim feminists have the connections and pre-established trust necessary to communicate these ideas to a general population. These are practical suggestions. We must use this conference as an opportunity to discover many more ways to change women's lives. So in conclusion and in essence, I think leadership is about having a vision, the discipline to work out how to achieve that vision, and the capacity to bring others with you. That's the challenge we have set ourselves in this conference, to articulate the vision, to set and train the means to work out how to achieve it, and to develop the capacity to reach out to our sisters worldwide to join us. Thank you.